I now give the floor to our Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, please. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Chair, uh, uh, David, uh, Nathalie, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, their friends in the European uh, Parliament. It's, it is really a great pleasure to, to uh, see you again, to engage uh, with you uh, again here in the European uh, Parliament, because I really appreciate this expression of uh, NATO-EU uh, EU cooperation um, uh, to meet with you. And uh, as you know, uh, to strengthen the cooperation between NATO and the European Union has, has been a top priority for me uh, since I uh, started my tenure as uh, Secretary General of NATO in 2014. I believe in NATO-EU cooperation uh, because we share the same uh, values, uh, uh, we share uh, uh, the same uh, challenges. We are two different organizations, but we have a lot in common. Uh, as you know, 600 million uh, Europeans live in a NATO country. And uh, when uh, Sweden joins uh, uh, NATO, 96% of uh, the citizens of the European Union live in a NATO country. So yes, we are different, different institutions, but we have a lot in common. Uh, and therefore, it is... Uh, it's good to see that over the recent years, we have been able to strengthen NATO-EU cooperation uh, on cyber, on space, uh, on critical infrastructure, on military mobility. And we work hand in hand in the Western Balkans, in, in Kosovo, uh, and also in addressing the illegal migration uh, uh, in the Aegean Sea and in many other areas. And this is also reflected through the fact that, as you referred to, that um, uh, earlier this year, I signed the third uh, joint declaration between um, uh, 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 the two EU presidents, um, uh, uh, President von der Leyen and President uh, uh, Michel, uh, uh, and then um, they participated in the uh, EU summit in Vilnius. Uh, uh, Ursula and Charles was there, uh, as I participated um, uh, in June. Uh, I met with all the, all the EU leaders in the European Council. So, so we meet at different levels, we work closely together, uh, reflecting the reality that we have so much uh, uh, together and need uh, to, uh, to work together. So I would like to commend you uh, um, uh, uh, as uh, European uh, parliamentarians for supporting these efforts, enabling uh, the strengthened cooperation between uh, the European Union and, uh, and NATO. And, and of course, we have a lot uh, uh, more to do but we could be quite proud of how far we have been able to move over the last years in, 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 in ensuring the partnership, the bond between our two organizations. NATO-EU cooperation has always been important, but the war in Ukraine has made it even more important. Uh, because this is the most brutal um, uh, war we have seen, uh, the biggest uh, war uh, we have seen in, in Europe since the Second World uh, War. Uh, and that makes it even more important that we stand together. And the reality is that um, President Putin made at least two big strategic mistakes when he invaded uh, Ukraine last year. The first and most important was, of course, that he totally underestimated the Ukrainians, the strength, the commitment, the courage of the Ukrainian people, the Ukrainian political leadership and the Ukrainian armed forces. The other big strategic mistake he made was to underestimate us. Our willingness, our, our, our uh, commitment to support Ukraine, to stand by Ukraine with economic sanctions, with political support, but not least with the military uh, support. And that's, uh, 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 and that's unprecedented, what we have seen now, of uh, uh, military support from NATO allies, from EU members, from uh, EU, from NATO. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and this is a support which is much bigger than anyone expected when this war started, with, um, with advanced uh, artillery, with, uh, with uh, long-range cruise missiles, uh, uh, with... Uh, with uh, uh, advanced air defense systems uh, with a lot of uh, ammunition and not least training from EU, from NATO uh, uh, allies. And, uh, and now also I would like to commend uh, the Netherlands, Denmark and also Norway for announcing that they are ready to deliver F-16s. And many allies have also announced that they are ready to start uh, training uh, of Ukrainian pilots and, uh, and uh, technicians to enable them to have uh, F-16s. 
So again, there is much more we need to do, and we need to support and sustain this support. But if we just stop for a moment and think where we are today, compared to where we thought we were going to be just weeks ahead of the uh, invasion, I think we need to, to recognize the, 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 the strength, the commitment, not least uh, enabled by the European Parliament, uh, for uh, EU members, for uh, NATO allies, for our institutions to stand by Ukraine. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and that's extremely important to recognize because uh, this is something that needs to uh, continue. Our support has helped to enable uh, the Ukrainians uh, to launch the counteroffensive. Uh, they, uh, uh, the Ukrainians are gradually uh, gaining uh, ground. Um, uh, and uh, uh, it is uh, uh, and, it, and it proves uh, the importance of our support and also our ability and and, and willingness uh, to continue uh, the support because this is heavy fighting, difficult uh, fighting, but they have been able to breach uh, the uh, defensive lines uh, of uh, the Russian forces, and they are uh, moving uh, uh, moving uh, forward. Um, as you, uh, and that was also the clear commitment and clear message from the NATO summit uh, in July, uh, that we need to continue to support uh, Ukraine. That has been the message from the European Union again and again. Uh, and, uh, and the offensive just highlights the importance of, uh, of standing by them. Um, um, at the NATO summit, um, the, the main message was, of course, support Ukraine. We were also uh, able to make progress uh, on uh, Ukraine's path towards uh, 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 NATO membership. Um, we we recognise what the European Union has done uh, in granting them candidate candid status. Um, in NATO, uh, at the Vilnius summit, we made important decisions to help to move Ukraine closer to uh, membership. We reiterated that Ukraine will become a member of NATO. But then we added three elements which actually uh, uh, move them closer to membership. First, we agreed a substantial package and also funding for a, a substantial package to ensure full interoperability between the Ukrainian armed forces and uh, NATO. And interoperability between our armed forces is really a way to, in practical terms, move NATO closer, uh, move Ukraine closer to, uh, to NATO membership. The second thing we did was to strengthen the political institutionalized uh, cooperation. We established something called the NATO-Ukraine Council, where we don't meet Ukraine as a partner, we meet as equals around the table, uh, uh, 31 allies, soon, soon 32, and then with uh, Ukraine uh, around the table as an equal. This council can make decisions, uh, it can convene on a short notice, it can address uh, uh, crisis, uh, uh, as we did uh, uh, just after the summit with, uh, uh, when, the, when the grain deal was suspended. Uh, and, and, and the plan is now to really develop the NATO Ukraine Commission uh, to a practical, to an important tool to strengthen the bonds between uh, NATO uh, uh, and, um, and, um, and uh, Ukraine. And the third thing we did at the NATO summit was to uh, remove the requirement for membership action plan for Ukraine to become a member. Because previously, the idea was to grant the country a membership action plan, and that was a step towards uh, uh, invitation. Uh, at the Vilnius summit, we said that there is no need for a membership action plan, because uh, uh, Ukraine has already moved closer to, uh, to NATO. So we turn now the membership process um, uh, from a two-step process to a one-step process. And these three things, uh, the, the interoperability, the NATO Ukraine Council, and the removal of the requirement for a membership action plan for Ukraine, uh, 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 are the, uh, demonstrates that Ukraine has never been closer to a membership uh, in NATO than now. And let me just end by saying that this reflects the, the political reality that nations are sovereign, nations decide themselves, and Ukraine has, of course, the right to, to, try, to de decide its own path. And it's up to Ukraine and NATO allies to decide uh, when uh, Ukraine becomes a member. Uh, Russia cannot veto uh, uh, membership for any sovereign independent state uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. The other main uh, uh, issue at the NATO summit uh, was uh, to strengthen our deterrence and defense. Uh, because fundamentally, NATO has two tasks uh, when it comes to the war in Ukraine. One is to support Ukraine, as NATO allies and NATO does do. Uh, the second, 
uh, is uh, to uh, prevent escalation. And uh, uh, therefore, um, uh, uh, we have already increased our presence in the eastern part of the alliance to send a very clear message to Moscow to remove any room for misunderstanding, miscalculation, that NATO is there to defend every inch of NATO territory, one for all, all for one. Uh, uh, at the NATO summit, uh, we agreed new plans uh, uh, for the defense of the whole alliance. Uh, we also agreed uh, to establish and to identify uh, uh, more high redness troops, 300,000 troops on uh, different levels of high uh, redness, um, and also have more uh, um, air and naval uh, capabilities, um, ready to quickly reinforce uh, if needed. The purpose of this is to prevent war. The purpose of this is to ensure that NATO continues to be the most successful alliance in history because we have prevented any military attack on any NATO allies. And when there is a full-fledged war going on in Europe, then it becomes even more important that we have credible deterrence. And by strengthening our deterrence and defense, we are preventing war, preserving peace for NATO uh, uh, allies. Because there is no room for miscalculation. Um, and the third thing was that uh, uh, NATO allies uh, have really now demonstrated that they are delivering on the commitment we made in 2014. Uh, because the war didn't start in February last year, it started in 2014. The full-fledged invasion happened last year, but the war, the illegal annexation of Crimea, uh, uh, Russia went into East Donbas in 2014. Since then, NATO has implemented the biggest uh, uh, adaptation of this alliance in modern uh, history, in, in, in decades. Uh, and part of that is to invest more in defense. I think I've told you before that I know it's hard to allocate money for defense, because most politicians uh, want to spend money on health, on education, on infrastructure instead of defence. But sometimes you have to invest in defence. And when tensions are going up, uh, risks are increasing, then we have to invest more. And uh, uh, this year we expect NATO allies to increase defence spending by more than 8% in real terms. This is the biggest increase in decades. And it shows that uh, uh, allies are now, and of course many of them, most of them are, are also EU members, um, uh, are now taking this very seriously. More money for defense also enables us to invest more in production of ammunition, which is extremely critical. I welcome the efforts, I welcome the decisions by the European Union, uh, which goes hand in hand what we do in NATO. In NATO, we have, uh, we have different uh, uh, arrangements for joint procurement of ammunition. We have done that for many years. We have something called a NATO Support and Procurement Agency. I welcome uh, efforts by EU members, NATO allies, uh, to jointly uh, ramp up production. And we work closely with the defence industry throughout the alliance uh, in, uh, in EU, but also in non-EU uh, allied countries, uh, uh, to uh, produce more. And more spending is a pre-condition uh, uh, for also uh, increased uh, production. Um, then uh, lastly, um, uh, uh, on, on Sweden, so first of all, it is historic that uh, 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 now Finland is a member of the alliance. Um, and we have to remember the background. The background was that President Putin declared in the autumn of 2021, and he actually sent a, a draft treaty that he wanted NATO to sign to promise no more NATO enlargement. That was what, what he sent us. And that was, that, that was a precondition for not invade uh, 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 Ukraine. Of course, we didn't sign that. The opposite happened. He wanted us to sign a promise never to enlarge NATO. He wanted us to remove our military infrastructure in, in all allies that have joined NATO since 1997, meaning half of NATO, all the Central and Eastern Europe. We should remove NATO uh, from, from that part of, uh, of our alliance. Introducing some kind of E and B, or second class membership. We rejected that. So he went to war to prevent uh, uh, NATO, uh, more NATO uh, close to its borders, he has, he, he has got the exact opposite. He has got more NATO presence in the eastern part of the alliance, and he has also uh, 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 seen that Finland has already joined the alliance, and Sweden will soon be a full member. Because at the Vilnius summit, uh, uh, we agreed um, uh, a, a statement uh, where uh, it was clearly expressed how uh, Sweden will uh, do more, uh, follow up the agreement we had in Madrid on uh, fighting terrorism, um, uh, and also address issues related to 
um, export of, uh, of military equipment. And then uh, um, uh, Turkey made it clear that they will uh, ratify as soon as possible. This has been reiterated by President Erdogan several times. So I expect that when the Turkish parliament reconvenes later this autumn, uh, the ratification will happen uh, as soon as possible, which has been stated again and again. And then uh, we will be 32 allies, and both Sweden and Finland uh, will be members. Uh, this, is, this is good for uh, the Nordic countries, it's good for Finland and Sweden, and it's also good for NATO, and it demonstrates that uh, uh, when President Putin invaded a European country uh, to prevent uh, more NATO, he's getting the exact opposite. I think I've used my 10 minutes or even more so, so I think I stopped there to allow as much time as possible for comments and questions. I'm looking forward to our, to our discussion, so thank you so much. Thank you very much, Secretary General Stoltenberg, for your introductory remarks. That was good input for our Q&A session. I now first give the floor to our Chairman of the Delegation for Relations with the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, Tom van denken de Lade. Tom, the floor is yours for three minutes. Thank, thank you for the floor, David, and I also appreciate holding this very timely, important and indeed already traditional exchange of views with the NATO Secretary General. Mr. Stoltenberg, I want to congratulate you for another year at NATO's helm, but also pay tribute to your leadership, dedication and your commitment to keep us as Europeans free and safe. And if I look back at the Vilnius summit, I was glad to see the sustained demonstration of transatlantic unity and de determination in responding to Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. I think in Vilnius, the alliance came up with the right responses to the, challenging, to the challenges we're facing together. It is clear that NATO remains essential for the security of our continent, the EU, and the partners in Europe and all citizens involved. And that's why I think we should continue to focus on uh, the partnership, the strong partnership between the Union and NATO. Allow me three short questions in that regard. The first one, uh, beyond the obvious need to continue working together in supporting Ukraine, what indeed would you describe as the most urgent priorities of EU-NATO cooperation after the signature of the joint declaration? The second question with regard to our legislative ambition on the joint procurement of military equipment, EDIRPA, and the act in support of ammunition production, ASAP, as well as to NATO's new defense and production action plan, what would be your assessment of the coordination between EU and NATO concerning the delivery of military assistance to Ukraine, precisely the coordination between uh, the, um, the two. And thirdly and lastly, and I've already asked uh, this question to you before regard, regarding the protection of democracy, how would you assess the feasibility of effectively establishing the envis envisaged NATO Center for Democratic Resilience still under your term in office? It's an institution which Congressman Gerald Connolly and I have been pleading for already in the past. Thank you so much for being here with us today and for the frank exchange. Thank you, Tom. And now I hand over to Nathalie Loiseau. She will chair the second part of our meeting. Thank you, David. Now I will give the floor to you, colleagues, starting with uh, AFET and CEDE coordinators for two minutes each. Uh, and the first is Michael Gale for EPP AFET. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary General, for your uh, input here and your continuous presence in our, in our committees. Uh, I think that's very valuable for us, and I would also particularly also as uh, the standing rapporteur for Ukraine, thank you for your continuous and relentless uh, efforts and, and uh, policies that, uh, to, to strengthen uh, uh, Ukraine's defense capabilities and to, to motivate our member states to deliver uh, uh, constantly and, and more, uh, as, as definitely more is needed. Um, um, I wonder, as you referred, and it was referred to, to our ongoing legislation, EDERPA and ASAP, uh, when it comes to, to uh, better standardization and, and also the efforts to get the uh, uh, common procurement better, uh, do you see potential in our legislative part that we can deliver better for the common cause? Uh, do you see there uh, concrete points where we should embark on uh, in, 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 the, in the immediate future. One question. Another totally different one when it comes to the grain uh, corridor, uh, what you, the Ukraine has unilaterally declared uh, as the Black Sea is not a, an exclusive Russian domestic uh, sea, but an international waters. How do you see, how could we uh, help Ukraine secure this, let's say, for the area as soon as we enter 
uh, either Romanian waters or the international waters that Bulgaria. they could be. Well, near further south is, of course, I thought you were, you were involved, uh, included there, but uh, now my point is to say that we in international waters and Romanian and Bulgarian waters, we can definitely be present. Is there a plan to secure such a grain uh, in, in the future? And last appeal behind the scenes, please push on all hesitating governments. And in my German case, please push behind the scenes the German chancellor in person to deliver the Taurus missiles. That is my concrete plea to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we go to Tonino Pizzula for uh, s and Merci. Welcome to FS Secretary General. It's good to see you here since the timing of exchange is very, very relevant, unfortunately, I would say. Uh, thank you for your introductory remarks. Uh, uh, furthermore, I would like, like to ask you uh, more information on following uh, questions. As my colleagues yeah. mentioned already, the European Union is fully embarking on a mission to strengthen its own defense industry and encourage joint production and procurement of defense products, notably with the recent EDIRPA and ASAP regulations. How uh, and does NATO plan on engaging in similar projects? And if so, will it coordinate with the EU to ensure interoperability and smarter, more efficient spending? Um, another aspect I'm uh, curious, uh, what are the immediate challenges NATO is facing in Black Sea in the context of Russia's war against Ukraine? And something I think it's also interesting to hear uh, uh, from you. Can you provide us more information about alliance cooperation with Asian partners? First of all, Japan and South Korea in light of more and more assertive China's policy in the region, as well Pyongyang's ongoing deals with the Kremlin. Thank you. Thank you for Renew Europe, Petras Austrevicius. Thank you, Natalie. And um, Secretary General, most welcome to the European Parliament once again. It's always a pleasure to have an uh, open and frank uh, exchange with you. Uh, indeed, uh, we're facing absolutely new security situation whatsoever. And uh, with the Russian uh, missiles, uh, at least parts of them falling on the NATO territory, it's something what we have to reflect uh, uh, appropriately. I mean, this is nothing uh, about theory. It's uh, a very gloomy practice we have to reflect by our decisions. My first question, Secretary General, is about the lessons from the uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine or lessons from the Ukrainian front, uh, what the member states of NATO and um, um, those uh, uh, interlinked with EU must learn. So we see absolutely different level of using drones. I would say the war went uh, dronized and uh, it's not a limit i mean uh, which is reached are we learning we are we taking into consideration uh, uh, absolutely different uh, situation in the skies i mean at least small flying objects uh, which change as well as mining uh, the density of mining uh, mines used i mean different mines used uh, in in a war it's something which uh, uh, hasn't been predicted uh, by many experts so that's why the Ukrainians are completely right. Once they say that we, I mean they, they fight something like in between of World War I and World War III. So we have to probably understand this. And my second point, Secretary General, is about the hybrid threats which come from so-called uh, private military formations. They are not private. I mean, they are mostly state-supported. But uh, sometimes, I mean, from my point of view, we simply... Uh, deny, I mean, uh, and do not take into full consideration the existence. What can be done and uh, what kind of the actions we might predict? Thank you. Thank you. Um, for uh, SND again, uh, the city coordinator, Sven Mixer. Yes, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary General, for being with us. Uh, a question. Uh, to you regarding, uh, could you expand on, 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 on two points in the uh, uh, final communique of the Vilnius summit that you briefly also mentioned in your introduction. Uh, first, the def uh, de uh, defense spending pledge. 
which was originally made in 2014. We've seen significant progress uh, with regard to increasing defense spending, but there's still a very long way to go. So how, how do you see the current state of implementation and what are your expectations of getting where we want to get? And the same question about the um, new sort of high availability of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the new pool of high readiness forces. I mean, NRF has been there for quite some time. Now we have a different uh, uh, structure that we that we have uh, set up by by Madrid summit uh, communique and and uh, Vilnius summit communique. Uh, how do you see the the progress in, in in the implementation? What do you expect to happen by the end of this year and beyond uh, when it comes to the getting to these three hundred thousand uh, pool of of high readiness forces? Thank you for ECR Vitol Vashikovsky, Sorry. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Natalie. I'm here as uh, Secretary General. Uh, first of all, congratulations for the extension of your mandate. We are happy and appreciate your service and performance as a NATO chief. I would like to express a couple of critical remarks about the summit, but please don't take it personal. Vilnius was a good summit, but not as good as Warsaw summit for the eastern flank. Um, eastern flank security is not enhanced uh, by the additional presence of NATO troops. We were expecting that NATO battalion groups are uh, turned into brigades or even higher. Nothing happened. Secondly, we've got additional more detail elaborated contention, contention, uh, plans. Um, but who is going to manage the uh, plan? Who is going to command defense of the eastern flag? There is no regional NATO command to defend the eastern flag. So what are the benefits for Eastern Flank, which is 250 kilometers away from Russian border and more than 500 kilometers away from the force located somewhere in the western part of Europe, to defend Eastern Flank. Thank you. Thank you. For the left, Mick Wallace. Thanks very much, Natalie. Mr. Stoltenberg, NATO has been vocal in identifying China as a threat. The Vilnius Summit Declaration states that China is trying to subvert the so-called rules-based international order and criticizes China for being opaque about its strategy and intentions. Now, my first question is, how is it possible to subvert an order that has no constitution, no basis whatsoever in international law? And if you think it does, in fact, appeal to or have a standing in international law, why then do NATO and NATO members repeatedly violate international law without any consequence? Yugoslavia, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, for example. China has not illegally invaded and bombed a sovereign country in over 40 years, while the US and our allies have hardly stopped in the same period, killing millions of civilians, displacing millions more, and illegally sanctioning dozens of countries to the point where tens of thousands of men, women, and children are extrajudicially executed each year for simply existing in a country targeted by Western imperialism. Is it not time to return to multilateral international forums based on diplomacy and international law, like China has repeatedly urged the US to do? In July, 
NATO called on China to play a constructive role as a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council and to abstain from supporting the war effort in any way. The reality is that their positioning has allowed them to play a constructive role as a potential mediator for peace. It was NATO, the EU and the US who dismissed their peace plan. You yourself ridiculed the plan, saying that China didn't have much credibility. Credibility is about consistency and being believable. China has stayed neutral in the war, did not impose sanctions, still trades with Russia and Ukraine, and has flatly stated that they will not supply weapons to either side in the conflict. The EU has armed one side in the conflict, imposed massive sanctions, but continues to be one of Russia's biggest trade partners. Tell me, Mr. Stoltenberg, who has the most credibility? Now, I give the floor to um, Antonio Lopez Isturiz White, uh, who is a Fed reporter on NATO, for two minutes. Merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Um, I wanted to tell you, of course, you only had 10 minutes for your presentation. And uh, let me tell you that I fully share your priorities that were shown during these 10 minutes. But there is one thing. Sorry to say, I'm a little bit obsessed, and uh, many, some of our colleagues here also, which is our southern flank. Um, I might want to hear from you, maybe in the answers, a little bit uh, uh, more about the strategy. There are very warning uh, signs coming with uh, eight coup d'etats in three years in Africa. Uh, we have been kicked out of many countries, let's put it in a <laughs> diplomatic way. Uh, so what's, what's, what's your point of view, the top priority, you know, we should be addressing in this question? Second, I come from Spain. As you very well know, Secretary General pays only 1.26 of our budget to NATO. Do you think this is a good figure? Could we improve it? We Should we improve it? Uh, I think that's also important to know from your perspective. And third, we have received during these weeks information that uh, Q1 Army is now present uh, in Russia, ready to take uh, action against Ukraine. Do you have any intelligence or information about it? Uh, Q1, the Q1 Army is not to be, you know, is not very effective, but in Q1 intelligence it is. So it is for us a matter of worrisome that uh, they are present. Uh, we would like to know if you have any kind of thought or information about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we have many colleagues who want to have the floor. Uh, so in order to have all of you speaking and uh, more importantly, even to have the Secretary General able to answer, I would really ask you to uh, uh, limit uh, your intervention to one and a half minutes, starting with Zeliana Zovko. Thank you, um, Secretary General. Um, I will ask you the questions that may be a bit forgotten. Uh, there is a book called uh, My War Has Gone By, I miss him so, by one famous journalist who was a war reporter in Bosnia and Herzegovina. What shall we do about Bosnia and Herzegovina? Um, you said that you are jumping over this uh, membership requirement, and so for so many years NATO was uh, asking so many questions and posing, and we have so many... Uh, crisis situation there, and recently Bakir Zbegovic called all the Muslim world to unite and help against the US and the Western allies in this electoral period. So is there any chance that we are uh, having attention there and doing some preventive diplomacy before uh, this, uh, this area uh, becomes, uh, again, hotspot? Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for being so concise. Now I give the floor to Elena Yoncheva. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Stoltenberg, uh, in advance for your answer. My question is specifically about the Black Sea and the Black Sea countries. The Black Sea is about to become a conflict zone in which Bulgaria and Romania, two NATO countries, can be directly involved in the war. Uh, how uh, would you comment on such situation, on such development? Also, do you expect a revision of the Montreal tra Treaty? And how do you intend to implement a possible increased NATO naval presence in the Black Sea if the war will escalate? So, in brief, what is your strategy for the Black Sea? Can we expect a full-scale scale war in the Black Sea region? Thank you, Nadans. 
Thank you. Next is Katarin Che from Renew. Thank you, Secretary General, and thank you very much for uh, this frank conversation uh, that is possible to conduct with you here. Uh, and first of all, we would very much uh, looking forward to welcoming Sweden uh, in the alliance, a cause uh, for which my party in Hungary has been calling for repeatedly. Uh, but I would like to ask you two brief questions. Uh, first of all, uh, as you know, here in the European Parliament, uh, the Foreign Affairs and the Human Rights Committees are working very hard to assist Ukraine in uncovering, documenting, and sanctioning crimes against humanity that is committed by the Russian aggressor against Ukrainian civilians, often minors. And of course, our goal is to help bring justice to the perpetrators of these heinous crimes. Uh, so if you could elaborate a little bit uh, on the most severe types of crimes committed against these civilians, uh, I think that would be very much appreciated. And also how effective do you think Ukrainians are in thwarting those crimes and how could the Euro-Atlantic com community help improve these capabilities? And another question that I think uh, a lot of us are being worried about is the situation around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant that is currently running <coughs> on very limited capacity. And based on the expert data provided by the uh, Atomic Energy Agency and Intelligence, how would you assess the current level of threat? And if the front lines move in the area of the Dnipro River, how do you think the Ukrainians can take it back safely? Do contingency plans exist for the different scenarios in this very dangerous environment and also for the wider Central Eastern European region? Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Hermer Ntersch for ECR. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Stoltenberg. It was very interesting uh, your exposition. I have two, uh, two short questions. Uh, one of them is about Turkey. Uh, we have a, in Turkey a NATO member who has a, a very sp special, special role in this crisis. Uh, and some of us wonder uh, where it is in every moment with this special connection which it has. Uh, indeed, with with Moscow and uh, the special operations they they uh, they handle between Erdogan and Putin, which are more or less outside the the common front of the of the NATO policy. And the other one is the connection which was referred by <coughs> my colleague Isturiz Lopez Isturiz with uh, with Cuba. We know now we confirmed that we have we have soldiers on the front in Ukraine on the spot, uh, Cuban soldiers. Uh, we wonder how long it will take that we have other people of the Foro de Sao Paulo, like Venezuelans or Nicaraguans, in this, in this part of the world, as we have Russians, as we have Russians in their, in their countries. So uh, uh, isn't it necessary that the NATO takes really an, an overall uh, look on what we are doing with some Latin American countries, as Cuba, which we are supporting after knowing this kind of actions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Can you please switch off your microphone? Sure. Thank you. Next is Claire Daly. Thanks, President. Um, Mr. Stoltenberg, you asked us to look at where we are today compared to when the invasion started. I'm not really sure what you meant by we. I know you spent a lot of time on NATO. Maybe that's the we about the expansion with Sweden and Finland. But you were considerably quieter about the bitter disappointment experienced by Ukraine in Vilnius, that the hopes that they thought of a path into NATO didn't actually work out according to plan. Our chair said that aid somewhat compensated, which others have kind of said is that Zelensky's silence was basically purchased. But in essence, really, haven't you let Ukraine down in terms of the pathway to membership? And on the subject of Ukraine, is it not the case that your rhetoric and reality are going in opposite directions and the world is beginning to notice because you said that Ukraine is gradually gaining ground. That's not true. Since you were here the last time, Ukraine has lost territory. A half a million men are dead. Ukraine has had to resort to conscription 
There's reports of signing people up with disability, with mental illness, men paying money to get out of the country, hiding in their houses. We're now in a bloody war of attrition, and it's simply cruel for it to go on. Now, senior US military personnel are even getting into the pages of the Washington Post and so on, echoing the call made by General Milley last November that there should be peace and a real peace. If you care about Ukraine, what's your attitude for a peace plan to save Ukrainian lives? Thank you. Next is Fabio Castaldo. Thank you, thank you very much, Madam, Madam uh, President. Dear Secretary General, thank you to be with us today, this morning. Both you and NATO, as you underlined, have uh, recently released significant documents, such as also the strategic compass in our case, that the, which may have been partly overtaken by the events due to the Russian aggression in Ukraine, but remains highly relevant, and the NATO strategic, strategic concept. Historically, EU and NATO have sought to operate with great coordination and in a complementary perspective. My first question is about the new opportunities and synergies that do you see? To of possible further improvements uh, in this partnership. I'm thinking in particular of the NATO, about the NATO Innovation Fund and the Diana program, which should undoubtedly synergize with the efforts that the EU is making to strengthen its defense industrial base and, the develop, and to develop its strategic and technological autonomy, primarily through the European Defense Fund, among other existing and future initiatives. Are there existing or planned coordination platforms for this aspect? Also, I wanted to ask you, how can we ensure that our efforts to achieve great, greater interoperability at the European level remain aligned with NATO's interoperability efforts? And I would like also to ask you if you would support a stronger and more structured coordination within NATO among the countries that are also EU member states, taking into account that now there is almost a complete overlap. Uh, last question. We have news of massive movements of troops, military equipment and munitions from uh, Azerbaijan towards the border with Armenia that are very worrisome. There is a real risk of a new criminal war of aggression by an authoritarian regime against the democracy, not only in the dispute region of Karabakh, but also in, uh, in the Zangezur in southern Armenia. Azerbaijan received weapon system from several NATO countries. What is your position, NATO position, on this risk of escalation? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is David Lega. Thank you so much, Chair, and uh, thank you, dear Secretary General, for taking the time to be with us here today. I just have to start by saying that as a Swede, I am very grateful for all the hard work that you have put in to finally make Sweden a member of the NATO family, so thank you for that. We had a lot of questions today and uh, interventions about the southern flank and the eastern flank. I wanted to, to focus on the other, the last flank, because of the recent increasing tensions between the USA and China and also its threats against Taiwan. So I would like to ask you, what, what do you think NATO's role against new transnational threats like foreign interference from China is and also about AI? How can AI play an effective role in this and actively combat the misuse of AI? Thank you. Thank you. Next is Dietmar Köster. I would like to speak in German. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Secretary General for your presentation. I've got a couple of questions. The first relates to um, bombing, and we've had uh, huge numbers of um, people killed in Ukraine by cluster munitions. And we've now heard that Ukraine is also using cluster munitions sent by the US. 95% of all people who are killed or injured are civilians. The European Parliament in May 2009 spoke about the Oslo um, Convention banning uh, cluster munition. We welcomed it and all member states um, supported this. So firstly, I'd like to say that 
we spoke out in favor of this um, cluster munition ban. So what is the plan here? And what is the plan if Ukraine cannot achieve its goals? We have seen this war last years already, where millions of people have lost their lives. More and more of Ukraine has been destroyed, and it looks that we're going to end up in a very, very long war, a war that could involve all of Europe. And what should we be doing about that? Thank you. Thank you. Next is Javier Nart for Renew. Hablaré en español. I'll speak Spanish. Mi deseo. I want Ukraine to get all its territory back, including Crimea. I want Ukraine to be part of the European Union and NATO, but the reality is somewhat different from what I would like to see. The reality is if Ukraine is part of NATO, we'd have to be dec to declare war to uh, uh, against uh, Russia, because uh, a NATO country would have been invaded. So until the war is ended, Ukraine cannot become a member of NATO. Since 1943, we've seen that even the best troops of the, uh, the, the SS, the Panther, uh, were unable to defend 40 kilometers of defenses from Kursk. So even without uh, air superiority, it was clear that uh, Ukraine would not be able to advance in its much um, touted uh, um, uh, war. And going to Tomak and Mariupol, they have to go through certain defenses. They've been, un they've only been able to make a small dent on Russian uh, forces. So. This is a frozen conflict. So what will be NATO's policy with this frozen conflict, which is the reality of what we will see in Ukraine? And uh, we cannot accept this, of course. Next is Martin Gyongyosi. And my pronunciation. <laughs> Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Stoltenberg, for being with us here today. And a special thank you for bringing into your introductory remarks the reference to the 2021 autumn Russian uh, uh, draft agreements that were sent to NATO and the United States, which were not accepted, but which very clearly show the Russian intentions and Putin's intentions. And I think when we are talking about this war, this is where the argumentation should start. What are the Russian intentions? It is crystal clear what Vladimir Putin's design is, and Ukraine is only the first step in this strategy. And all those people, prime ministers, who within the alliance are talking about accepting Vladimir Putin's peace terms, forget this, and they should be reminded of Russia's intentions. What Vladimir Putin sent to NATO and to the United States is the revival of the Brezhnev doctrine. And all those people who lived for 50 years behind the Iron Curtain should know what the Brezhnev doctrine is. What Vladimir Putin sent to NATO and the United States is exactly this. So when we are talking about the war in Ukraine, then we should uh, talk about this uh, draft agreement and remind all those who within the alliance are speaking uh, Putin's narrative are uh, wrong and they should be getting on the side of Ukraine. So my question is, uh, Mr. Stoltenberg, is does the NATO, does NATO have the instruments to fend off these internal uh, Trojan horses and those who want to weaken the alliance from within by playing Putin's narrative. Because NATO, when it was designed after the Second World War, it was designed for a classical warlike situation, for a Cold War, but it was not designed to fend off these type of hybrid, uh, uh, hybrid attacks against the alliance from within. Thank you very much. Next is our colleague, Milan Mon. 
Gracias, Presidente. I'm going to speak in Spanish. Thank you. I'm going to speak Spanish, uh, Mr. Secretary General. Firstly, thank you for your presence here and your presentation. A great deal has been said about Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. I just want to change uh, focus and uh, talk about the Sahel. In uh, 22 and uh, paragraph 22 of uh, your communique in Vilnius talked about uh, the, the problems in the Sahel after what we've seen in Niger. What is the situation there? And extending to the BRICS with countries that were, what we've seen, you have Saudi Arabia and all of the, in this very strange cocktail, Iran, all these countries going to the BRICS. What do you think about this alliance? Thank you. Next is Thies uh, Reuten. There it is. Thank you, thank you, Chair. And thank you, Secretary General, for being here. And, and let me thank you also that in a bad moment, I sometimes watch the clip of your previous visit here uh, that you posted yourself after being here uh, because it encouraged us to stay focused. Uh, and my first question relates to Ukraine uh, because we need to give Ukraine what it needs to win instead of not, uh, just not to lose. Uh, and therefore, I want to ask you, we knew we needed to give them the tanks. We started asking for that a year ago, and still we waited. We knew we will need to uh, deliver fighter jets at some point to secure, let the Ukrainians secure their airspace, and still we were hesitating. And now we know that they need these ATACAMs, the long-range missiles. Can you explain the rationale behind accepting that Russia can attack from everywhere, uh, Ukrainian hospitals, uh, schools, and uh, what have you, but that we are engaging in debates with producers of these long-range missiles to limit the range. Can you explain the rationale behind that um, to me? Second question um, relates to what our colleague uh, said. Uh, members en um, engaging still with, um, uh, with Russia, um, playing lip service to uh, Russian narratives, but also uh, non-members that are exercising with uh, a, member, a member state of NATO, like uh, Serbia, that regularly, almost weekly, visits uh, Russian, uh, uh, Russian uh, high-level uh, diplomats or even visits Russia. Can you uh, comment on that? And last thing, you met with uh, President Vucic. Did you unequivocally say that it's absolutely unacceptable to uh, in in engage or in ignite um, uh, violence against NATO personnel? Thank you. Thank you. Next uh, is Vlad Georg from uh, Renew Europe. Thank you. Um, very specific questions on a very specific matter. A Russian drone, at least a Russian drone, exploded on the territory of Romania a couple of days ago. A NATO member. Uh, first of all, the Ukrainian side has told us three days ago, at least three days ago, that this happened, but the Romanian authorities didn't find it or didn't admit it until yesterday. Uh, first question, did the Romanian authorities inform NATO that indeed there was no dr uh, Russian drone explosion? Did they afterwards inform NATO that they found the Russian drone that exploded on NATO territory. And third, and very important, what is NATO doing to defend that piece of border, of NATO border? Because we have a lot of citizens living there, and the Russians are attacking nearly every night on that piece of uh, Danube border near the port of Ismail, more exactly. So what is NATO doing for its citizens in order not to have those Russian drones exploding more and more on our territory? Thank you, Secretary General. Thank you. Next is uh, Alexon colleague Alexander of Yondanov. Uh, thank you. I will speak in Bulgarian. Uh, Mr. Stoltenberg, I would like to thank you for attending yet another meeting of our committee and for replying to our questions. I have two brief questions. My first question is on 
the warning Russia issued about creating a new security zone on the territory of the Black Sea. Russia calls this zone a new warning zone. This zone affects the exclusive economic zone of the Republic of Bulgaria. It is a threat to the security not only of Bulgaria but of the whole region. What specific action has been undertaken to fend off Russian aggression in the Black Sea? More specifically, what is Bulgaria's role within this specific action? My second question is, has already been touched uh, by colleagues. This is the first war in Europe in this century where only one party to the conflict bears the brunt of it, and that is Ukraine. Russia does not really bear the brunt of this war. It is not affected by its own atrocities. I would like to know when finally Russia will feel the brunt of the war it started, when R Ukrainian missiles will be directed at Russia. Thank you for your attention. <coughs> Yes, next is Nikos Papandreou. Yes, uh, thank you very much for being here. Um, you have a very difficult task, and one of the difficult tasks is answering all of these questions, which I think show a range that any democracy should have, from very pro-war to those of us who question uh, whether this war will have a conclusion in favor of the Ukraine. That's what we want. We hope it happens fast. People are dying. And as many colleagues said, it's a very sad situation. We find ourselves here and from SND supporting a war and supporting more weapons, something that I didn't expect to do in my lifetime, but here I am supporting a war. Uh, being Greek, I can't help but hope that you're, you bring your considerable prestige and status to ensure that when Sweden joins, it should not become a bargaining tool for it to reduce its governance. Sweden is one of the highest levels in the Scandinavian countries that Greece is jealous of. Governance, quality of democracy. And uh, I hope that the bargaining tool that is being used by Turkey does not reduce Sweden's democratic principles simply because there is a strong <laughs> bazaar, as they say in Greece, going on. And I know, you, I know you've done much to get in that direction, and I hope you use your considerable prestige to ensure that Turkey remains the NATO member that you, we want it to be. Thank you. Thank you. Next and last is Georgios Kertsos for Renew. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank the Secretary General for his presentation and for his excellent work. Maybe he should not become a central banker. He should stay in NATO. Uh, uh, I have a question concerning the economic performance of Russia. It seems to me that the Russian economy is more resilient than we anticipated. Uh, there is a successful shift towards India and China and Asia in general. Uh, they are producing more weapons with the help of different countries, like, for instance, Iran. Uh, they have a good understanding with uh, Saudi Arabia and the OPEC plus, so they keep raising, uh, try to keep raising uh, the price of oil. Uh, and according to what I read, to what I read, uh, their GDP is going to increase from four to five percent in 2023. This doesn't mean that they don't have a lot of problems, but it means, in my view, that they are in a position to keep financing um, this aggressive war for the years to come. Uh, does the secret does secretary general share this um, assessment with me thank you thank you colleagues a lot of uh, precise and diverse questions mr secretary general so um i'm sure that thanks to you we will have precise answers the floor is yours you have 10 minutes 
Thank you so much. Uh, I will really try to address as many as uh, possible of the issues you have raised, but, but, but there are so many precise and concrete answers that uh, questions that I'm not, uh, not able to go all into all of them, but we'll try to group them. Um, and first of all, I'd like to thank you for, for, uh, for the questions, for the interest. Uh, and also, I think that uh, uh, this, this uh, session and all the questions you have asked demonstrates the value of NATO-EU cooperation, because most of the issues you have raised are issues related to how NATO and the EU has to work together to address uh, common, uh, common challenges. And many of you ask questions about Ukraine and how we can support Ukraine and what we can, uh, can do more for, uh, for Ukraine. And first of all, there is coordination going on um, uh, uh, at the political level, uh, but also in the very practical level. We have a coordination cell in uh, Wiesbaden uh, where uh, NATO allies, EU members are together and uh, very practically coordinating the aid and the support. Uh, uh, both identifying the needs from Ukraine uh, and then uh, 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 approaching different countries, ensuring that we build uh, packages of support, because you need to understand that when you deliver military support, it's not only about delivering a cannon, it's about delivering that uh, artillery piece, but also the ammunition, um, the, the spare parts, the training uh, and uh, maintenance, maintenance uh, uh, facilities so, so we can ensure that the whole system can, uh, can work. And some of you asked me uh, what is the top priority, and I think that in one way the top priority now is to ensure that all the systems which are already in Ukraine actually works. Because, uh, because there is an enormous need to provide ammunition, maintenance, spare parts, to ensure that the systems which are already delivered actually function. I'm not saying that we should not consider to deliver new systems, and we are now in the process of delivering F-16s, but in the public debate, it's perhaps a bit too much focus on new systems, instead of ensuring that all the existing systems have all the maintenance they need to actually uh, 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 function. There is coordination. I've been there myself. It's very impressive how NATO, EU allies, uh, the United States, Canada, United Kingdom, but also, of course, a lot of uh, EU members, uh, are together and in a very practical way uh, coordinate uh, and I ensure we will continue to do uh, so. Second, on standardization and, 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 and procurement. Uh, again, I welcome the things that the EU does. NATO has uh, also different programs. We have, we met, so we, we realized uh, last fall or last summer that this was going to be a war of attrition. Uh, uh, so then production becomes extremely important. Uh, in the beginning, we depleted our stocks to provide support to Ukraine, but our stocks are not big enough, so we need to ramp up production. The reality is that our production capacity is not as big as it should be. That's the reason why we now actually see some good progress in new investments and uh, more production uh, throughout the lines in EU and, uh, and non-EU NATO allied countries. Uh, I welcome the efforts of the European Union. Um, and NATO, as I mentioned, had this, um, we have done joint procurement for many, many years through the, uh, through the uh, NATO Support and Procurement Agency. And also groups of allies, uh, EU, non, uh, EU allies, are going together and, and doing joint procurement. And some are just doing it individually as allies. To be, to be honest, the most important thing is not the framework where we decide to ramp up production and procure ammunition. The most important thing is that we actually do it be it in the EU framework or a NATO framework or a group of uh, uh, con countries or individual allies. And the thing that really matters is to sign contracts. Uh, we need nations to sign contracts because that enables the industry to invest and to ramp up production. And standardization is, of course, key. That has been an issue for NATO for decades. We have now uh, uh, stepped up uh, uh, our efforts to ensure standardization because we've also seen some gaps uh, there. And of course, this has to be a NATO effort because, as you know, 80% of NATO's defense spending comes from non-EU allies. So if we, we, and we need standardization across the alliance. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, we welcome the, uh, the, the increased efforts by uh, as by, uh, by NATO to do more on, uh, on standardization. Um, uh, then uh, on, the, on the offensive and, uh, and whether Ukrainians are gain, gaining ground or not. Well, I think we have to remember that uh, no one ever said that this was going to be easy, the offensive. It was clearly stated that this was going to be a bloody, difficult and hard offensive. Because what we have seen is, of course, that the Russians have 
prepared defensive lines, layers of defensive lines, with trenches, with uh, uh, obstacles uh, to uh, battle tanks, dragon teeth, uh, and uh, 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 mines, enormous amounts of mines. Hardly any time in history we have seen uh, more mines on the battlefield than we see uh, in Ukraine today. So it was obvious that this was going to be extremely difficult. But the Ukrainians decided to launch the offensive because they are going to liberate the land. And they are making progress. Not perhaps as much as we hoped for, but they are gaining ground gradually. Some hundred meters per day. Meaning that when the Ukrainians are gaining ground, the Russians are losing ground. And we have to remember the starting point. The starting point is that the Russian army used to be the second strongest in the world. And now the Russian army is the second strongest in Ukraine. <laughs> and that's quite impressive by the Ukrainians. And that's the courage, the will, the commitment, the determination of the Ukrainian soldiers that are making this uh, possible. And we also need to remember the starting point. And the starting point was that when the invasion happened, the full-scale invasion happened in, the, in February, we were told by most experts that Kiev would fall within days and Ukraine would fall within weeks. The Ukrainians proved them wrong by pushing back the Russian invaders, liberating the north uh, around Kiev, the east around Kharkiv, and then bigger territories in the south and around Kherson. And now they are gaining more ground, liberating more Ukrainian territory. And then the same experts that told us that Ukraine will fall within weeks are complaining about the speed of the offensive. The reality is that the Ukrainians are actually exceeding expectation again and again. And we need to remember what's our responsibility. Our responsibility is to support them. We can advise them, but it has to be the Ukrainian commanders, the soldiers on the ground that make the difficult decisions. We cannot sit here in Brussels, in the NATO headquarters, on the EU headquarters, and tell them exactly how to fight. That's their task. They're risking their lives, and we just support them. And we praise them for the courage. And then, and then I say this also because wars are per, by nature unpredictable. No one knows exactly where we are in a week or two or a month or a year from now. And, and hardly any war, we will see only, once I say, victories for the side we support. There will be bad days and good days. We need to be with Ukraine not only good times, but also bad times. So those who are conveying kind of message that, well, only if they win, we will continue to support them. No, we support them when they win and if they lose. We are there with Ukraine. Because to support Ukraine is not an option. It's a necessity to ensure that we preserve peace for our members, for our countries, and to ensure that authoritarian regimes doesn't uh, achieve what they want by violating international law and using military uh, force. So I, 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 just, I, just, I just tell you that, of course, sometimes it's, it's hard to imagine how brutal this war is. But, but, but we need to never forget our responsibility uh, to provide support uh, to uh, Ukraine. Then um, I had a concrete question about the drone, um, uh, the possible drone. Um, the Romanian authorities uh, have, uh, have confirmed and informed NATO uh, about that debris from a potential um, possible dr uh, drone um, have been found uh, near the border uh, with uh, Ukraine. Um, uh, they informed uh, NATO allies in a regular meeting uh, yesterday about uh, all their uh, findings and the investigation is going uh, on, uh, and uh, uh, it demonstrates uh, the risk of incidents and accidents. We don't have any uh, information indicating any uh, intentional attack by, uh, by Russia, and we are awaiting the, uh, the outcome of the, 
uh, ongoing investigation. Uh, regardless of that outcome, uh, what we have seen, of course, is uh, a lot of fighting and, uh, and also air attacks close to NATO borders. And we also had other incidents uh, in Poland and, and, and elsewhere. And therefore, uh, we have uh, increased our vigilance. We are closely monitoring what's going on um, uh, close to our borders. And we have also uh, increased our presence uh, in the eastern part of the uh, alliance. Um, well, there were questions about the Black Sea. Um, the Black Sea is of great importance for uh, NATO. Uh, we condemn uh, that uh, Russia has withdrawn from the Black Sea grain deal. We welcome the efforts by Turkey to try to re-establish the uh, grain deal. Uh, and, um, and uh, uh, of course, the best way to ensure safe and secure shipment of uh, grain from Ukraine is to end the war. The reason why we have these problems is because of the war. Uh, and then uh, the grain deal is a way to try to mitigate uh, some of the consequences of uh, the, uh, uh, the war. Let me also say that we have increased our presence in the region. Um, we have done that over a long period of time, but especially since, uh, since, since the war with more maritime patrol aircraft, uh, with battle groups in Bulgaria, in Romania, um, uh, and, uh, and we are closely monitoring the whole situation in uh, the uh, Black Sea region, including the littoral uh, states. Um, there were a question about uh, the, 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 the difference between the Vilnius and the Warsaw summit. Uh, and uh, we told, <laughs> yes, also I will not compare two very successful summits. Uh, but, 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 but there is a difference, is that you're right, that in, in Warsaw, we decided to deploy new bat groups. What we did uh, actually uh, before Vilnius was that we, uh, when the morning of the invasion, we activated NATO defense plans. And by activating NATO defense plans, we give Sarkar the authority to deploy more forces where and when he uh, deems that uh, uh, necessary. So he has increased the presence in the eastern part of the alliance. We have doubled the number of battle groups from four to eight. Uh, and uh, we have more air and, uh, and, uh, and naval forces uh, uh, available. Uh, so we, we will do what is needed to defend every inch of allied territory. This is part about forward presence, but it's also very much about our ability to reinforce. And that's the reason why a more uh, high readiness forces is the key uh, to address any potential threat uh, caused by the war in Ukraine and Russia's aggressive uh, actions. Then I need to move on. Uh, south, um, so many questions about that. The South is, of course, of great importance for uh, NATO. Um, uh, uh, the instability in uh, North Africa, Middle East, creates um, threats and challenges for the whole alliance, not only for, for the Southern allies. Uh, we have our presence in Iraq to help them train and equip their forces to uh, uh, fight uh, terrorism, ISIS. Uh, we work with countries like Mauritania, Tunisia, to help them uh, uh, fight terrorism. Um, State of Jordan, uh, another uh, close partner of, uh, of NATO. Uh, but I think we need to realize that this is also very much about economic and diplomatic efforts, where also other institutions than NATO has to play uh, a, a key uh, role. So again, an area where we work together, NATO and the European uh, 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 Union. Um, uh, then uh, China. Um, China, we don't regard China as an adversary, uh, but uh, we are concerned about uh, the challenges that uh, China poses to our values, to our interests, and to our security. Uh, China doesn't share our uh, values. They, they don't believe in freedom of speech, democratic values, uh, and they have expressed that quite clearly. Um, uh, they have they crack down on journalists, on, on opposition, uh, uh, on dissidents uh, across uh, the uh, country. Uh, we have seen how they have cracked down on democratic rights in Hong Kong. Uh, we see how they uh, are threatening Taiwan. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and we see how China is investing heavily in uh, uh, modern uh, nuclear weapons, uh, uh, more military capabilities, and also long-range uh, uh, missiles. And how they also work more and more closely together with Russia just before the invasion of uh, of uh, Ukraine, Russia and uh, China uh, signed uh, 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 an agreement uh, uh, where they promised each other uh, a partnership without any limits, and China has not condemned the invasion of, uh, of uh, Ukraine. So, uh, so, 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 so I think we are, what we need to realize is that 
security is not regional, security is global. Uh, what happens in Ukraine matters for Asia, and what happens in Asia matters for us. Uh, and therefore, we welcome the stronger partnership we have with the Asia-Pacific countries. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea participated in the NATO uh, summit, and, and we are ready to do uh, even more, uh, to do as much as possible to work together with these, uh, these uh, uh, countries. Um, then, I had a then I had several questions about defense spending. Well, also, of course, I would have liked to see all allies meet the 2% uh, guideline. That is not the case. But I'm, I'm encouraged by what allies are doing. They are ramping up uh, uh, spending. And since 2014, all allies have increased defense spending. Back in 2014, when we made the agreement, we had only three allies meeting the 2% guideline. Now 11 allies meet the 2% guideline. And all, almost all allies have plans in place to be there within a few years. Uh, and even those allies who are not at 2% have significantly increased. Germany is one example, where actually in spending is going significantly uh, up. So uh, yes, uh, 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 I, 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 I see progress, and I welcome that uh, progress. Then I think since my time is really running out, a few more minutes. OK, then I can I'd say one thing about this paradox about uh, weapons. Uh, uh, because um, also because um, uh, also, because you, you said the representative from uh, from uh, from uh, Greece uh, said that uh, that in a way he never believed that he would support the delivery of weapons to Ukraine, and I think for many people that's a paradox. It is a paradox because we 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 all want peace. We all want to invest in something else than uh, than uh, than weapons, but the problem is that sometimes you need to invest in weapons to ensure peace. That's a basic thing. And that has, uh, that's, that's a lesson we have learned again and again. Uh, and, I, and I remember very well the end of the Cold War, where we all were able to reduce defense spending. I don't know exactly the defense spending in Greece, but I know that the defense spending in my country was 3% of GDP at the end of the Cold War. Yeah. Uh, 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 and then we reduced it to just about 1%. Uh, and I was responsible for that, at least not all of that, but part of it. Because I was a Norwegian politician, and, and across the lines, pol government, parliaments reduced defense spending because tensions went down. We saw less threats. We believed in a new partnership, and we believed in the possibility of working with, uh, with Russia. And I was a strong believer in that because we have seen again and again in history that, that old enemies can become friends. Uh, you see that in Europe, France, United Kingdom, Germany, and France fought each other for centuries. Now they are closest friends and allies in the European Union. And if you go to the Nordic countries, we have been fighting each other since the Viking age uh, for, hundreds of, uh, for hundreds of years. And now Swedes and Danes and Finns and Norwegians are you know, the best friends. It's a big, so it's possible. So I believe it was possible also to overcome, as we have done in Europe for most European countries, within the framework of the European Union and NATO, to also overcome that a relationship with Russia. Russia didn't choose that path. Russia decided to control neighbors, to try to re-establish sphere influence, and saying that there was a provocation if a country decided to join NATO. It is not a provocation. It is a democratic sovereign right of every nation to choose its own path. And therefore, we had Georgia in 2008, we had Crimea in 2014, and then the full-fledged invasion in 2014. Russia has walked away, uh, and I regret that, uh, but then uh, there is no other option for us than to ensure peace for NATO allies, for EU members, by investing in, uh, in uh, defense, uh, supporting Ukraine, uh, because um, if... Uh, if President Putin wins in Ukraine, it's a tragedy for the Ukrainians, but it's also dangerous for us. It sends a message that when they use military force, they get what they want, authoritarian leaders. So it's in our security interest to support Ukraine, and therefore I'm extremely grateful for all the support that EU members, the European Union, and NATO allies are providing to Ukraine. Thank you so much. Dear Secretary General, also on behalf of Nathalie Loiseau, let me thank you for attending our joint meeting of the Foreign Affairs Committee and our Subcommittee on Security and Defence. We very much welcome that you take your time to come to the European Parliament on a regular basis and your input is very valuable for our work. 
Colleagues, I would like to ask you, is there anything to raise under any other business? If that's not the case, our next meetings will be on the 20th and the 21st of September. Thank you for attending and your good participation.